we have uh, Dr. Um, Trevor Hasty, who is uh, the John A. Overdeck Professor of Statistics and Biomedical Data Science here at Stanford University. Many of us uh, have worked with Trevor, and we know how incredible he is. Uh, those of you who um, come to Stanford come for reasons to work with people like Trevor and to learn from him. He's um, best known for his work in applied statistics, particularly in the fields of data mining, informatics, machine learning. He's applied this broadly, including areas in biology, genomics, medicine, and industry. Um, he has so many awards, and to list them would take um, most of his speaking time. So I'm just simply going to say that he's fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, the American Statistical Society, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the South African Statistical Society, and elected member of the International Statistics Institute. And I'd like to add a little bit about his background. Uh, prior to joining Stanford University in 1994, Trevor worked at AT&T Bell Labs for nine years. Here, he helped develop statistical modeling environment popular in the R computing system. Uh, he received his BS in statistics from Rhodes University and his uh, master's from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And then he came to Stanford to complete his PhD. And um, we were so grateful that he returned to Stanford and joined the faculty. And so with that, if you could all just join me in giving uh, Trevor a welcoming round of applause. Well, thank you for the nice introduction, Sylvia. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And it's nice to see a lot of friendly faces. At least they're friendly now. Maybe the, when the questions come, they won't be so friendly. So it's great to be here. Um, by the way, the list of awards wouldn't have taken that long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. um, so that lovely picture is Sequoia Hall. That's where uh, the statistics department is. This is the place where I've been for the last 21 years as a, as a faculty. And it's also the place where a lot of my heroes um, live and work and, and lots of stars. This is the place where the bootstrap was invented, um, cart, KD trees, the lasso, um, wavelet shrinking, sure shrink, stein shrinkage, and the list just goes on and on. So it's a truly awesome place to be. And uh, quite honestly, it's really humbling for me to be there. Um, you know, when I was hired 21 years ago, um, I was, at, as Sylvia said, I was at AT&T Bell Labs in the Data Analysis Research Group. Um, and really, if I think about what we were doing there, we were data scientists there. We were working a lot with computations and, and building algorithms with, and handling massive amounts of data. And so I think I was actually hired as a data scientist. I think there was a hole in the faculty, and that's the hole I filled. So whenever I got, felt insecure, I used to remind myself, well, that's why they, they hired me. So then after a while, the insecurity went away, and you know, it's hard to get fired, so you start relaxing. <laughs> so anyway, so this is a great department. We have um, our main product is our PhD program. We have wonderful PhD students. There's typically about 50 to 55 there at any given time. And literally, we get the pick of the world in, in terms of students. And it really makes a difference. So we, we love our students. Many of them are here today. I'm glad to see. Um, um, they'll probably give me a hard time afterwards. Um, we also have, um, we have a, we've actually have a, had an um, a undergraduate degree program called MCS, Math and Computational Sciences, um, which is essentially a data science undergraduate major. And it's been going on for 25 years, where the students learn computing, statistics, and, and some math. And recently, we started a, a data science master's program joint with ICME. So that's the end of the propaganda. So now we'll get on to the talk. So oh, and some of these slides were shared from my colleague, Rob Tipirani. We share a lot of things, and including slides. So this talk is, uh, is about supervised learning. Um, this is the where you build models from data and predict an outcome using a collection of features. So there's, there's, you're going to see, I'm going to mention a lot of um, techniques. There's some powerful and exciting tools for making uh, predictions from data. So they're not magic, and um, we should be skeptical. So they require um, good data and proper internal validation. And human judgment and ingenuity are essential for their success. So a lot of these algorithms and things we work with tend to be black boxes, but we have to use our smarts when we use them. And this is especially so with big data. With big data, model fitting takes longer. 
this might uh, test our patience for model evaluation and comparison. And it's also difficult to look at the data. We teach our students in statistics to look at the data, see if there's any anomalies. With big data, it's much harder to look at the data. And there may be contaminations in parts, and it's just so massive you might not see it. So in this case, careful subsampling can help with, with both of these. So those are just some, some take-home messages. So, so here's some definitions. Um, machine learning, which really evolved in, in, in computer science departments, these are methods for constructing algorithms that learn from data. Um, statistical learning is really something that evolved in statistics departments, and it's a branch of applied statistics that emerged in response to machine learning, but it emphasized more statistical models and assessment of uncertainty, which are things that tend to happen in, in stats departments. And then data science, which is a relative uh, newcomer, um, it's, a, you know, it's a fancy name, and it's, you might describe it as the extraction of knowledge from data using ideas from mathematics, statistics, machine learning, computer science, and engineering. And it's the a, it's a sort of new hot um, uh, qualification to have. But they're all rather similar with different, uh, with different em emphases. And then, of course, there's applied statistics, which has been around for a long time. And, you know, I've been an applied statistician my, uh, statistician my whole life. See, you know, I can't say the word. Um, and, uh, you know, statisticians have always had to deal with data. And as computers got bigger and, and faster and the ability to collect data got easier, we had to deal with bigger data all the time. So at Bell Labs, I mean, there's no question that we were dealing with big data. We had tons of data coming in from various sources. We had to deal with it. So in a sense, applied statisticians have been doing this all the time. Now, this sounds like a little bit of sour grapes from applied statisticians. Um, not really. I mean, I think having been in this game and sort of been in the statistical learning, what we also learned is that sometimes we, were, sometimes we were a bit cautious and it was good to get nudged from some of the more progressive ideas in, in say, computer science. So, for example, neural networks, when they came out, that was a big nudge for applied statistics. They were fitting models on a much bigger scale than we typically um, had done. And so we kind of moved in that direction too. So there's a lot of nice synergies between, between all these fields. Okay, well, as you might have gathered, it's getting a little bit cooler to be a statistician. So, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, if I took a plane trip and somebody asked me next door, what do you do? I'd lie, right? <laughs> well, I'd tell them I worked with computers. You know, not anymore, now we own up, right? So here's some nice quotes that we use sometimes. To, uh, to forward the message. So Hal Varian is a chief economist at Google, and he's, he said, I keep saying the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. 2012, um, there was a quote, the data scientist, the sexiest job in the 21st century. So it's really, it's becoming quite cool to be a statistician, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's a People magazine, and you know, things are changing for statisticians. So. <laughs> He's right here, you can get his autograph afterwards. <laughs> so, okay, so supervised learning. So this is, this is the topic of the talk today, or the general theme. So what happens here? You have, you have data, input data, um, that's coming in on the left. You have some learning algorithm, and then the idea is you use the learning algorithm using the input to try and predict some output. So each of the inputs has an associated output, you use a learning algorithm to predict the output, and then once you've built the model, you have, you have, whoops, you have, some, you have some new output, you use your model to predict the output. So that's the idea of supervised learning, and the algorithm you know, goes through this paradigm, and each time, each time you go through it, it sort of updates itself and learns by its mistakes. And so the output is supervised in the algorithm to learn, you know, in, to learn it using the inputs. So you have training data, fitting, and prediction. Now, in traditional statistics, the domain expert would work for 10 years to learn good features and then bring the statistician a small, clean data set, which is you know, what we've been used to for a long time and still do in, in some studies where it's hard to get data. But with today's approach, we start with a large data set with many features and use a machine learning algorithm to find the good ones. And so this, this is a huge change. It's big data set almost has to be much more automatic you know, and so, so that's a bit of a game changer. And so one of the things that calls for is internal 
model validation, right? So it's really important, and we, uh, Rob and I, emphasize this a lot, lot when we teach our courses on, on statistical learning. So don't trust any, me or anyone who says they have a wonderful machine learning algorithm unless you see the results of careful internal validation. So for example, uh, divide the data into two parts, A and B, run the algorithm on part A and then test it on part B. If it works in part B, you have some confidence in it because the algorithm didn't see part B. Okay? So it's simple, right? It's a simple paradigm. Um, does it done, is it done properly in practice? Rarely. Because people cheat, inadvertently they cheat. They peek at the data, they try it once, it didn't work out quite right, so they try something else, you know, and they end up using, you know, abusing this kind of system. So rigorous control of this kind of validation has become a central part of, of good model building today. And here's a, here's a, a quote from one of our famous old statisticians, Deming, God we trust, all others bring data. So we want evidence from the data. Okay. So this talk is meant to focus on big data. So here's, here's, a, here's a cartoon of two types of big data. So they, they big data vary in shape. And these call for different approaches. So we have wide data. So this is meant to be a data matrix. Right? The rows are observations and the columns are variables or features. Okay? So with wide data, we've got many more features than we have observations. In statistics, we have a sexy way of describing that. We call it the P bigger than N problem. Not really sexy. So, <laughs> so, this, you know, so this, is, this, is a, um, this comes up in, for example, in genomic experiments. You might have thousands or millions of variables um, and hundreds of samples. And so this calls for a special class of techniques, and I've listed some of them here. So just variable screening and, and false discovery rate control. So that basically means go through the variables one at a time and see how they relate to the response. And then, but then you're doing things like multiple testing, so you have to screen for, you have to be really careful about making false discoveries and you control that in various ways. And then there's a lasso, um, support vector machines and, uh, and, and stepwise methods. So these, these are methods that one might use in, in this class of uh, data. So you have too many variables prone to overfitting, need to remove um, variables and regularize the models or both. So then you also have tall data. This is the other extreme. You've got not so many variables, maybe tens or hundreds of variables, but you have many observations, maybe thousands, millions of, of, of samples. Okay. So there we can afford to be a bit more aggressive and fit richer models. So we might fit uh, generalized linear models or random forests or boosting or deep learning. These are some of the names you might recognize. So we can fit quite rich models, rich functional models where we model interactions and higher order interactions and really um, can afford to fit lots of parameters. And then, of course, you get tall and wide data. So these are the behemoths that are hard to deal with, okay? Thousands or millions of variables and, and millions to billions of samples. And these, you know, these are a problem. They require what I now say tricks of the trade, okay? So there's various tricks that we can exploit. For example, sparsity. I'm going to give you an example later on where we had uh, 50 million observations and 7 million features or variables. So that's massive, but it was extremely sparse, and so we could, we could exploit that. Um, there's, there's other tricks, random projections, hashing. Variable screening, subsampling of the rows, divide and, and recombine techniques, case control sampling, map reduce, ADMM, and the list goes on. Uh, all kinds of tricks for, you know, managing these large amounts of data. I mean, you can't even store it. You have to destroy it, to store it in, in large distributed system on the clouds and so on. And in order to fit any kind of algorithms, you have to generally use some kind of trick. Or you can just give up on the tricks and join Google. They've just got enough computing power that can fit these big models, and they do. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some, uh, some con more concrete examples of, of big data learning problems. So we, we, we go and visit a web page, and um, so we're in the Google search page, and we type uh, pickled herring. Now, why did I pick that? Pickled herring. Well, actually, I gave a talk at the opening of the, the new data science center at the University of Leiden in Holland, and you may know that 
the Dutch love pickled herring and lots of other weird foods as well. <laughs> so this was <laughs> trying to make fun of the Dutch. They, did, and in, they did, didn't laugh at all. <laughs> it's quite natural to them. So anyway, so you, know, you all know the story. You put in a search word, um, some things come up, and some ads come up on the site, some sponsored links. Um, and you know, so the question is, what, what ads should come up on the side? Well, there's a lot of modeling goes into deciding what ads should show up on the side. So something called click-through rate becomes important. So based on the search term that you typed, knowledge of the IP address of the user, you, who's, who's typing the address and, and what they've learned about you, and the web page about to be served, what is the probability that each of the 30 candidate ads in an ad campaign would be clicked if placed in the right-hand panel? So that's a prediction problem that ad serving companies have to deal with. And what they do is logistic regression with billions of training observations. Each ad, each ad exchange does this, then bids on the top candidates, and if they win, they serve the ad. Now, the, the models are fit offline, but the evaluation of the 30 ads using this, the, the fitted model has to get done in real time, and all of this has to happen within 10 milliseconds because the ad's got to be served almost instantly on the page. So that's a big ma uh, modeling problem, and it uses tools that we're very familiar with in, in machine learning and, and uh, statistical learning. S so licorice, the Dutch also like salted licorice, right? <laughs> so examples of big, uh, this is another example. So s customers who, um, who viewed this item also viewed. So this is uh, recommender systems. Amazon online stores, online DVD rentals, Kindle books. Based on my experiences and the others are like me, what else would I choose? So there's lots of versions of recommender system. I'm going to talk about another one in a moment. Um, yes, some more um, examples of big data learning problems. So adverse uh, drug interactions. So the USA, uh, US FDA, Food and Drug Administration, um, they require physicians to send in adverse drug reports along with other patient information, including disease status and outcome. Massive and messy data. Um, and using natural language processing, Stanford BMI researchers in the Altman lab found drug interactions associated with good and bad outcomes. So this was a, this was a good example of what you can do with big data. When you do a clinical trial on a drug, you look, to look at the efficacy and the safety of a drug and, 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 and see if it works. Um, but you never have a big enough sample that you can look at interactions with all, any other, all other possible drugs that patients could be taking. And if there were a few, there's, the sample's going to usually be too small. But here you've got massive samples, and, and so you get to see a lot of cases where this interaction occurred, and, and you can learn if there's bad outcomes there. So that's a, that's a nice uh, success story for big data learning. Social networks. Based on my friends on Facebook and LinkedIn, make recommendations for who else I should invite or predict which ads to show me for an ad-serving company. So there are more than a billion Facebook members and two orders of magnitude more connections. So knowledge about friends inform our knowledge about you. And graph modeling uh, is, you know, and so there's various techniques that get applied to this problem. And graph modeling is a, is a hot area of research. And I know a lot of research on graphs and, and relations of, of graphs get done in the, for example, in Yuri Leskovich's lab at, in Stanford CS. Um, and I was on a PhD committee there recently and uh, I was pleased to see they were using, you know, well-known statistical models, Cox survival models for seeing how long it took for certain things to happen on, on social networks. So great to see that. So I think a lot of you know about the Netflix recommender system. You've seen some movies on Netflix. You've, if, you know, if you're good, you'll, you'll rate the movie and between one and five. And then based on what you've seen and perhaps how you rate it, Netflix will recommend new movies to you. So that's called a recommender system where they use information from you and other users like you to come up with the recommendations. Um, and uh, a few years ago, started in 2006, ended in 2009, Netflix actually started a competition. And <clears throat> they offered a million dollar prize for a team that could beat their recommender system. So they set up this competition, and basically what it was is they gave you access to a, big, a fairly big database, 400,000 users and 18,000 movies, 
And each of these users had rated, on average, 200 movies. But of course, they hadn't rated 18,000 minus 200 movies. Um, but they were all different, right? So you have all these users and, and which movies they've rated. And they rated them between 1 and 5. And then the goal is to, to predict how they would rate every other movie that they haven't seen. And then Netflix would use the highest rated ones for each user to, to, as a basis for recommendations, right? So this was a great competition, and it led to you know, a lot of research into statistical learning and, and machine learning techniques for solving this problem. It's been dubbed a matrix completion problem, because you've got a big matrix. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Big matrix, mostly missing. There are 41,000 teams participated, um, and the competition ran for nearly three years. And the winner was a team called Belcourt's Pragmatic Chaos, and it's essentially tied with another team called the Ensemble. And both of these teams were actually a union of many teams, um, and they combined their, these, these ensembles combined their predictions to come up with a, a better prediction, basically. And it was amazing. After three years, these two guys actually beat the Netflix by 10%, which was the bar that Netflix, Netflix had said, uh, beat their, their, their performance by 10% in root mean square error. And the two winning teams actually tied in terms of how much they beat Netflix by, exactly tied. Um, you maybe read better than me, 10 point, looks like 10.06 um, there. And, um, and then they had a, another validation set in which they had to give their final predictions, and they tied on that too. So it was a very, very close, very, very close competition. And uh, the team that won was actually some people from the old group that I worked with um, at Bell Labs. Um, of course, I'm not really trying to claim any credit for it, but I'd long since left. And in the runner-up team is uh, contained uh, Lester Mackey. He was one of the group, the ensemble group, which was the, the team that actually essentially tied. But it turns out that the winning team, since they tied in everything, they chose the winner by, uh, according to who submitted the final prediction earliest. So it was based on a time. That was the rules of the competition. So Lester Mackey is in the stats department. He's a... He's an um, applied statistician and uh, is a great addition to the department. So um, the, there's some details in the Netflix data set. You've got users, you've got movies. They've rated some. Most are missing. And you have to fill in the missing values and the general techniques. So this is actually an example of a sparse matrix because if, if the matrix was full, you'd have 10 billion entries, which is quite a lot. Um, but there's only actually 100 million ratings, right? So there's about one in, one in 100, there's a sparsity of one in 100. And that's something you can exploit when you model with these data. And a lot of the techniques um, used, or some version of what we call low rank uh, factorization or singular value decomposition. But I, I won't get into that. This meant to not be a too technical talk, so we won't be too technical. So. So what are some strategies for, for modeling um, big data? So I'm going to just list some that I'm aware of, and there's lots more. So once, once the data have been uh, cleaned and organized, we often left with a, with a massive matrix of observations. So if the data are sparse, lots of zeros or, or missing values, we store using sparse matrix methods, which basically means you don't have to store the whole matrix with all the zeros, you just store the locations where it's non-zero and the value. And that can be a, a massive saving. And you know, so we make good use of that. So I'm going to give you an example um, coming up soon. Quantcast is a, is a company. Um, we fit as a sequence of logistic regression models using our package GlimNet, which I'll tell you about too in a moment, in R. Um, with then this data set, as I, I mentioned earlier, has 54 million rows and 7 million predictors. So that's massive. If that, it's extremely sparse, and that's the only reason we could, we, we could actually fit the whole data matrix into memory with 256 uh, gigabyte machine. And we fit a series of 100 models. It took two hours um, to fit using, using the software. So that was really a case of exploiting sparsity at, at various different levels, which I'll, I'll elaborate on in a moment. And if not sparse, you know, use distributed uh, compressed databases. Many groups are developing fast algorithms and interfaces to these databases. Often the data, 
you know, the, the number of bits in, every, in any feature or variable is small, and so you can compress that information and store it in a much more compressed form and access it in a compressed form. And so I'll give you one example. H2O is a package in R, um, and the company that supplies it is called H2O as well. It's a fairly new uh, startup which builds uh, software for, for modeling huge data sets. Um, and this particular package interfaces to R. Um, and, but the data lives on highly compressed um, versions, on, on, in, in, for example, on the Amazon Cloud or in other cloud-based storage systems. And they use a Java-based implementation of, of many of the important modeling tools. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about Glimnet. This is a package that, that we produced in the statistics department. It's in R. Um, it's, got a f it's actually got a Fortran uh, core. Um, let me elaborate a little bit. This is the team, um, the, R t uh, the Glimnet team. This is myself, Jerry Friedman, Rob Tipsharani, and then Noah Simon and Yunyang Kian. And uh, Jerry Friedman is one of the world's masters in Fortran programming, very uh, good and efficient Fortran programming. He, Spent some of his earlier years at Slack. Um, he's, he had training as a particle physicist. Particle physicists are used to getting massive amounts of data, and so they need clever uh, programming um, to be able to deal with it, and, and Jerry's amongst the best. And so we have this package that fits a variety of generalized linear models. For example, here's a logistic regression model, which will be familiar to some of you. You've got a binary response, a set of features X, typically a large number of features, and you fit in a linear model. So it's a fairly standard model. But here we're going to use a lasso penalty on the coefficients. And what the lasso penalty does, puts a bound on the L1 norm of the coefficients, or the sum of absolute values. And as you pull, as you make S smaller, it's going to set some coefficients to zero. So the lasso is a big breakthrough, um, and, and, and it's very popular today. It, it does controls variance and does variable selection. And this Glimnet package fits lasso models for linear models in a wide variety of, of contexts. And it does that. It exploits the, the, the structure of the problem. It, it fits the models efficiently using coordinate descent, which is a method that no one would have dreamed 10 years ago would be an important method in fitting models with lots of parameters. But it turns out it's perfect for this problem. And, and it handles sparse x naturally. So sparse x means that data matrix is sparse. There's lots of zeros. And what coordinate descent does is it, it basically cycles through parameters one at a time, which means it goes through variables one at a time. And the chief operation in the algorithm is an inner product. And so if you've got a sparse variable and you compute an inner product, you only have to visit the non-zero non entries. Extremely efficient. It also exploits the fact that the solution, because of the lasso penalty, the solution is going to be sparse. So you can, use, you can use clever variable screening techniques and screening rules to, to eliminate the vast majority of the variables and just focus on an active set and, 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 and converge on an active set. And then, and then uh, you check afterwards to make sure it is the valid solution. So there's tricks of that kind that really make this work. And this package includes um, methods for a variety of models. And it also does cross-validation. So it's got built-in valid validation to select the tuning parameters. OK, so back to the, the big uh, logistic regression. So Quantcast is a, is a digital marketing company. And so this particular data set, uh, um, this little star says, I'm on the scientific advisory board for, for Quantcast. A little disclosure. Um, so the data are five-minute internet sessions. So each observation is a five-minute uh, internet session. The binary target is type of family. So it's binary. It's, it's whether they were less than or so they know, they know who the internet, the IP addresses for these sessions. They know the families because they, they provide uh, internet service to these families. And so less than or equal to two adults, in other words, a family without children versus a family with children. So it's a binary outcome. There's 7 million features of sef, uh, session info, such as web page indicators and descriptors, um, unigrams and bigrams described in the web pages. And uh, divided into a training set of 54 million, a validation set of 5 million, and an another test set of 5 million. So on this problem, all but 
so the first thing I did was screen the features. There were 7 million because all but 1.1 million had only non-zero values for three observations. Right? So you can't learn much for that. So you just, you just hedge them out of the problem. So that left 1.1 million features. Um, the way GlimNet works, you fit 100 models in, of in, increasing complexity. And on these data, it took two hours in R using, using GlimNet. And I'll show you some, some of the output. The richest model had 42,000 non-zero coefficients and explained 10% of the deviance. Deviance, 10% of the deviance, that's like saying it, it had an R squared of 10%, right? It's but for, for logistic regression models. But, you know, that's, I think it's the first time I've fit a model with 42,000 non-zero coefficients. I mean, that's massive for me anyway. And this, this was definitely the biggest data set I've ever fit a model to. So I thought before I can give a talk on statistical learning with big data, I better make sure I've at least done one. <laughs> you know. So, so this is a, a picture of, uh, that's described in the output. So there was a series of models, 100 models. And so here's one way of showing the models. What I'm showing you is on the horizontal axis, it's a percent deviance on the training data. So that's how hard are we fitting the training data. And that goes from 0 to 10% in this case. And on the vertical axis is the same measure on the test data, the left out data. How hard are we, how well do we predict the test data, also in percent terms of percent of, of variance explained. And what's remarkable is even with 42,000 parameters, what you see is that the performance on the training data is not much better than on the test data. You expect it to be a bit better, right? So in, I've got three curves here. There's the training curve, the test curve, and the validation curve. So, for, so and this is, mis, sorry, this, I beg your pardon, this is model, this is misclassification error for the binary outco outcome but they're all indexed by the performance of the models on the training data. And, you know, and normally you see, if, you've, you, know, if you fit 42,000 parameters, you might expect on the training data you do much better than on the test data. But you've got so much training data here, it hardly makes a difference. So this was a big revelation to me. And uh, um, it turned out, in, and, and there's some funny jumps going on here, it turned out in addition to these web features, we also had the time of the day and the day of the week for each of these sessions. And that explained a fair bit of the, of the, of the, the variance. And then thereafter, the, the web features started kicking in and, and explained some more. So oh, and this shows actually the contribution of this day of the week and time of the day. And this was also kind of cool, I thought. So here we see there's, five, there's seven curves here, one for each day of the week. And each curve is indexed by hours of the day. And this is the, what we see on the vertical axis is, so I've actually massaged this plot a little, but essentially it's a probability of a family with children given day of the week and time of the day. And it's really nice. What you see is that um, for the seven days of the week, from about 11 or 12 o'clock onwards, the probability of children jumps up, right? Because kids come home from school. And, uh, and then towards the evening when parents come home, and then it drop, drops down again. And here's the two Saturdays and Sundays where the, the story is different. But there's a lot of agreement between these curves. And then this one curve, which is a little bit out, that's Friday. So on Friday, people come home from work early, and so there's a bit of a departure. So, you know, I'm used to, I mean, th this kind of information is kind of weak in the data, but uh, when you've got so much data, these patterns jump out. And so it's nice to, it's nice to s see what big data can do for you, can, can really um, bring out signals that are potentially weak, but uh, with a lot of data, you can find them. So this is just another slide for, for H2O. Um, um, this is the company I told you about. I'm also on the scientific advisory board there. Um, and uh, so they implement algorithms for big data. And uh, the, this, is, this is one of the examples that they have. It, it's kind of impressive. It's an example from an airline data set that's got a billion rows. So that's, that's a massive data. I've never worked with a data set with a billion rows. And it's got 12 input columns and, and one output. But the input columns are um, nine numeric features and then three categorical features with lots of levels. So two of them have, one of them's got 376 levels and the other 380 levels. Those generally expand to make, you know, 
that many variables. So it's quite a lot of variables and, and, and a billion observations. And basically what they're giving you is they use various configurations. The data is distributed and compressed on, on the cloud. And they give in times like 5.6 seconds for two iterations of a, a Newton algorithm, which is really impressive. OK, some other strategies for modeling big data. Online stochastic learning algorithms are popular. Need not keep the data in, in memory. Um, Subsample, if possible. So, for example, when modeling click through rate, um, so that's for an ad, you want to model the probability whether someone's going to click on the ad or not. And you have lots of examples. Um, but, you know, in the training data, there may be one positive example for 10,000 negative examples. You know, because not that many people click. So, do you need to keep all the negative examples? Well, no. Um, you don't need to keep them because beyond some point, the variant com variance comes from the paucity of, of positives. So one in 15 is sufficient. So you can subsample heavily the negative examples. And so one of my recent graduates, Will Fithian, who's now at the University of California as assistant professor in statistics, um, we wrote a paper that's in the Annals of Statistics called Local Case Control Sampling, Efficient Sampling in, in Imbalanced Data Sets. So, and that's something that really works for that type of, of problem where, where the, you have a two-class problem but it's very, very imbalanced. Also, think out of the box. Just because you've got big data doesn't mean you have to fit, you know, the same old model you always fit and, and do it the same way. You can do, you can maybe be a bit more creative. So how much accuracy do you need? Uh, timely, timeliness can play a role as well, uh, as, as well as the ability to explore different approaches. So explorations can be done on subsets of the data and probably should. You don't need to use all the data to find out what kind of strategies are going to be good um, for the particular kind of problem. Um, so here's some work that's been ongoing with, uh, with my colleague Brad Efron sitting in the front here. Um, we, we call in it spray gun. Um, and the idea here, um, we had, so the data set is beer ratings. So these are based on, on reviews of beers. I guess a lot of them came from Germany, probably South Africa too. Um, there's 1.4 million such ratings. So these are documents. And, and there's three quarters of a million variables. And so these would be features taken from documents. So typically documents, the features that you extract from documents are the, typically the bag of words model, which words occurred in the documents. But in addition, you'll use bigrams and trigrams, like pairs of words that occurred together and so on. And so it's very easy to get up to big numbers, but these data are sparse, right? So there were three quarters of a million variables, 1.4 million ratings. This was the second biggest data analysis I've ever done. Um, but I thought uh, when I first gave this talk, people weren't too impressed. I thought I'd better go to the 50 million one. So, so if you, it turns out this, this problem you can still fit it using GlimNet in R, so we did it. But it took 70 minutes to fit the lasso uh, uh, regression path. So what we mean by this regression path um, is a sequence of models of increasing complexity. So the complexity is along the bottom here. And on the, uh, the way this is indexed, on the right, it's the least complex model, basically with nothing in it. And then we add in variables or reducing the, reducing the regularization. And so the models become more complex as we move to the left. And so the red curve, what you see in this red curve here is the test performance. And in this case, it's measured in terms of uh, root mean squared test error. Okay. Um, it's relative root mean squared test error. So it's like, it's like 1 minus r squared. But you, this one you want to be small. right? So we basically can explain about 50% of the variance in the data okay, for the best model, the red model. But it, Beyond some point, you start overfitting the data, and so on the test data, you start doing worse. Okay? And that sequence of models took 70 minutes to fit using GlimNet. So here's another approach. Split the data into 25 parts at random. Right? So you make much smaller data sets. Okay? And then fit the same sequence of models on 25 times on these smaller data sets. Make predictions on each of the smaller data sets, and then average the predictions. 
So on the smaller data sets, you're presumably going to overfit even faster, right? But when you average, you're going to reduce the variance. Well, actually, you can see that you overfit faster. So here is the performance on each of the 25 um, smaller data sets, right? The performance on the test data. And you can see it drops down like it did on the, the big data set, but then it starts to overfit much sooner, and, you know, and then you start doing worse. But if you first, if you average your predictions on the, on the 25 smaller data sets, that gives you the blue curve here. And it's got a rather interesting behavior in this particular example. So it doesn't do quite as well as if you fit the model on all the training data, but it gets awfully darn close, and it only took 30 seconds to produce the blue curve. But it took 70 minutes to produce the red curve. Okay? So this is a case where you can subsample the data, you can fit your models more easily on the subsamples, and, but then you can combine them. In this case, it was a rather naive combination, and there's cleverer ways of doing it. We just use the simpler. And you get a lot of other things for free because you've, you know, we always say in statistics, you know, when we compute, when we compute standard errors and, and, uh, and so on in statistics, we talk about the sampling distribution. What if you got more samples from nature? You know, how would the statistic vary? Well, with big data sets like this, you can actually mimic that. You can make samples that are independent, and so you can get direct access to sampling distributions, and you can do things like cross-validation for free. Um, and so, you know, so this, this class of techniques, I think, is going to be promising for big data. Here's another problem. Um, predicting the pathogenicity of missense variants. So missense variants, this is when you have a, DNA, a mutation in your DNA, That'll have an impact on your RNA, and that can have an that can have an impact on the gene. So missense variance is when the the RNA molecule that's produced after the mutation is not the intended RNA, right? This, um, and if, if the if the mutation occurs early in the exome, um, it can have dire consequences because it can have a big ripple effect down for the rest of the RNA, especially if it's an insertion. So this is a, this is a big problem. And so this is some work with my colleagues in epidemiology. Um, and, uh, and so their approach was actually to use an ensemble method. So there's a number of scores for scoring these missense variants. There's a database with 52,000 of these variants. And people have come up with various scores using various attributes of, of the particular um, uh, setup and mutation and, and what was around it and so on and to come up with scores for, for trying to, to, to classify whether these are going to be um, pathogenetic or not. Um, and so our, our aim here was to actually take 12 existing scores and come up with a good ensemble that combines them in, in a clever way and improves on them. And for that, we're going to use uh, random forests. So I'll just tell you briefly how that works, because random forest is one of those techniques that's a really important tool in our in our learning data, but in our tool of uh, a toolbox of, of techniques. So in this case, we have a training set where where we have uh, 52,000 variants, 21,000 were diseased, and 31 neutral. And so we want to try and predict that using some combination of these scores. Now these scores are correlated, um, and this is a correlation matrix. You might expect them to be correlated, but they're not as correlated as, as you might think. Some of them are very, but others are not, because they're all trying to predict the same thing. Okay. So, so um, you know, one approach that biologists have used for a long time is to subdivide the data, right? To try and find homogeneous subgroups and maybe make better predictions in homogeneous subgroups. And that leads to decision trees. Um, which is one of the techniques that grew up in, in statistics department, so-called CART and, 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 and methods related to it. Um, and what they, these trees do is um, use the features to create subgroups in the data to refine the estimate of disease. But unfortunately, shallow trees are, are too coarse and inaccurate, and, and so we need to do something better, and random forest is one thing you can use. And th these were introduced by... Another hero of ours in statistics, Leo Bryman, who, um, who passed away in 2005. And the idea here is that shallow trees are too coarse and inaccurate, so build much deeper trees. In other words, build a much bushier tree. 
And so you can really zone in, in into the important subregions and, and, and make a better decision. But deep trees are, are more accurate, but they're very noisy. They've got high variance. So his idea was, you know, it's kind of similar to the spray gun that I was telling you about. Fit many thousands of different and very deep trees and average your predictions to reduce the noise. So get rid of the variance that way. And he used bootstrap subsample versions of the data, and he also had other ways of randomly decorrelating the trees using randomly ignoring variables as candidates for splits. And so random forests are very uh, effective and give accurate predictions. And, they, and they're quite automatic, and they give uh, good cross-validation estimates of prediction error for free, just the way they work. So it's really kind of a plug-and-play technique, and you'll see random forests crop up all over the place. And partly, it's because they, they, they give good results, and they, they're really easy to use. And so there's a package in R called Random Forest. And so here's some results for, the, for these data. And uh, I'm showing you area under the curve, which all you need to know is that uh, the, the further you're up into the top corner, the better you're doing. And, and this is broken down for two different versions of the outcome. So it's doing pretty well. And so this is still work in progress. And you can also rate the, um, you can get variable importance. So the contributing scores, you can give them um, importance measures and uh, you can see my co-authors are a little bit cagey. Some of them are, the names have been blanked out because this is not published yet. So uh, those names will be filled in one of these days. And I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to very quickly tell you about two new methods that come from my, um, my PhD students. Well, he was a PhD student, and, and, but I co-advised Alexandra as well. And so the two techniques are called Glintonet and Gamsel. So one thing we learned from Jerry Friedman is if you come up with a new technique, you must come up with a nice name for it too, a catchy name. So these are pretty catchy. So Glintonet, uh, both of these methods use convex optimization methods. Glintonet is, is fitting linear models but with second order interactions and automatically finds interactions and it uses a group lasso to do that. And Gamsel is, is a way of fitting additive models. So additive models are like linear models except you allow for each variable, you're allowed a nonlinear transformation of the variable, which is chosen adaptively from the data. And, uh, and Gamsel tries to fit automatically decide for a variable whether you want it to be in the model or not, whether it should be linear or not, and if it's nonlinear, how, how nonlinear it should be. So, okay. So, there's some details on Glintonet. I'm just not going to tell you about these details. There's a paper. You can look it up. This isn't the, the time to, to really do that. Um, but it, uh, it uses something called a, a group lasso penalty for selecting the, the interactions. And it does it in a way that ob obeys hierarchy. So if you decide on interactions in the model, the main effects are automatically sucked in as well, which is kind of important for that kind of thing. And, and so there's various tricks. Um, Glintonet was originally posed for, um, for, for GWAS, where, where you have SNPs, and there's lots of them. And so we had an example with 27,000 SNPs. Each of these is a three-level factor, and we had 3,500 uh, samples. So now you've got 27,000 SNPs. The interaction space is essentially that squared. So that's a huge candidate interaction space. So you need to have, um, you need to have techniques that can maneuver in that big space, um, you know, cleverly. And for that we use uh, something called strong rules. These, I mentioned them earlier, rules for filtering features, um, and, and so you can reduce the active set. Okay, so um, just very briefly, there's an application, recent application of using Glintonet, um, uh, using Oncoshare, the Oncoshare database um, from the Stanford Hospital and the um, Palo Alto Medical Foundation looking for synergistic effects between 296 drugs in, in the treatment of, of nearly 10,000 breast cancer patients. And this is used with some of my, my colleagues in, in the other department I'm in, which is the, the new department, Biomedical Data Science. And, um, and so this is Nigam Shah and Yen Lo, and there's my happy-faced Michael Lim, again, the, 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 my PhD graduate. PhD graduate. And so we have a paper that's, um, that's under review. And you know this is a nice picture that's in the paper. 
kind of showing you some of the interactions. Um, there's a lot of details there. Um, I just wanted to show you the nice picture. I'm not going to interpret it. Um, but they, we found three um, putative strong interactions, and those are reported in the paper. Gamzo, well, um, let, me, let me explain some of the details of this slide. No, I'm only kidding. So <laughs> this, this is the criterion used to fit Gamzo. Um, this is the generalized additive model selection. I'm not going to explain anything. What I'll do here is, <laughs> is there's a paper, it's on my website. But what I'm going to show you is a little simulation to see Gamsel working. So in the simulation, there's, there's, uh, there's 12 variables. Um, and what we see is that the gray lines here are the true curves. So in the first, we see there's three, there's three variables that have linear functions. This one's barely non-zero. This one's, you can see it's linear, and this one's linear, both with relatively small slopes. These three variables have nonlinear functions, right? So this is in the context of this model here, right? It's a simulation, but I, st I know the truth here. And uh, so three nonlinear, three linear, and then the other six are all zero, so there's nothing. So I generate data from this model, and now I'm fitting the Gamsel path, which starts with everything zero, and then gradually adds complexity, just like the lasso bath does for, for linear regression. So I'll show you what happens as we, as we go through the path. You can see, OK, so the way it goes here, green, uh, blue means zero, that term's completely left out. Green means linear, and red means nonlinear. So as we're going down the path, the model's getting more complex. You can see that some of the nonlinear non terms are coming in. Um, there's some of the linear terms are coming in, and here we're sort of almost half, we're just over halfway down the path. At this point, it's doing pretty well, right? It's got the two, it's got the two stronger linear terms over here. It's got all three of the nonlinear terms, and, and all the guys that are meant to be zero are still zero. Well, of course, you, get, you carry on, and then it starts adding in more and more complexity until you get to the, the end of the path, well, it's overfit, you know, and it's, it's, everything's now nonlinear. But that's controlled by a regularization parameter, and I don't show it here, but you'd use cross-validation to pick a good value, how well it does on left-out data, and for this example, well, simulation examples tend to be nice, um, otherwise we wouldn't show them, and uh, for this case, it pretty much picked this model right smack on, you know, the one that was needed. So that's... Uh, so that's Gamsel. Okay. So there we're pretty much at the end. Um, user R, 2016, a little bit of advertising. So all the, the tools I described are implemented in R, um, which is this wonderful free software, which we love it in the stats department. Um, and it's getting increasingly more powerful. It's used in lots of departments all over Stanford and, and all over the world. Um, and they have an annual conference, and next year the conference is going to be at Stanford. Uh, so that's the, how they name the conference, User R 2016. It's going to be a special, a special conference. It, uh, it's going to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the S language, which is the language that's used in R, which was invented by uh, John Chambers, who's a consulting professor now at Stanford. He's retired. So we have the benefit of having him around as well, another one of my heroes. And it's also the 75th birthday of John Chambers next year, so we have a double celebration. And so this conference is here, so if you're interested in that, please attend. The, there's Nara sitting over there as the head of uh, the organizing committee for the R conference. He's making me work for it as well. So, the, so that's coming up and exciting. And now for some cheap marketing. There's <laughs> our three books. Um, these, these two have been around for a while. Um, the PDF for these books is free. These are books on statistical learning. They, they, the PDFs are available for free on, on our websites. This is a new book. It came out this year. It's called Statistical Learning with Sparsity, The Lasso and Generalizations. It's me, Rob, and, and Martin Wainwright, our colleague at Berkeley, came out in May. In January, the PDF for this book will be free on the, on the web as well. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and be happy to take questions.
So there's a traveling microphone, so if you have a question, just grab hold of the mic. Hello. Um, a couple times you alluded to generating a bunch of models and then averaging them. Yes. How does the averaging work? How do you get the correspondence between the coefficients in those models when you try to average them together? Ah. So these models are usually indexed by um, a tuning parameter, right? And so for any given value of a tuning parameter, you get a model. And you'll get a model from each of these 25 data sets at that same value of the tuning parameter. And so then you'll make a prediction for a particular new observation that you want to predict. But instead of getting one prediction, you're going to get 25 predictions. And then you literally just take the average of those predictions. If it's a quantitative response, if it's a, if the, but if it's, a, if it's a binary response, you're going to probably make a prediction of a probability, and you average the probabilities. Question over here? Oh, oh we got one over here. Sorry. Hey. Uh, so the, the basis behind supervised learning is that your training data comes from the same distribution as your test data. Okay. How do you when you have future samples, or how do you ensure, is there any statistical method to ensure that your training data actually matches the distribution of your test data? Because I see those mismatches happen a lot, especially if you train on one data set in one, say, hospital, and then you move to a different hospital with a, an yes. identical. Yes, no, that's, that's a good point. It doesn't. So, you know, they, they, that goes, there's various names that describe that. It's called data drift. Um, you basically have to be aware of that. Um, the assumption, you're correct, is that the, the the place where you're going to evaluate the model is the data comes from the same distribution. And if it's not going to you, need to, you need to somehow take that into account when you build your model. So for example, often that happens if, if time is involved. So data evolves with time. You know, so people often fit models, but they only use data a certain distance back in time. And as time evolves, you update your models. But that's definitely a problem that you have to you have to take that into account. Uh, traditionally, one might evaluate models not only by how well they predict things, but also if they give you some intuitive sense as to what's going on behind the scenes. Yes. I, I'm wondering with these models with millions or uh, of parameters, and uh, is there has one given up on trying to use a model to also get some insight as to what's going on, or is it is it purely a matter of trying to make a prediction? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's really hard to interpret a model with you know. So let's see. For our, um, one example, we started off with seven million features, but we ended up with forty-four thousand. That's actually a big reduction. But are we really going to interpret the forty-four thousand? Well, no. So, yeah, no, that's a problem. So we do try to have ways of, of you know, evaluating. Often these features, when, when you have lots of features like that, they come in groups, right? So there will be contributions from, you know, from, from uh, say, document features like bigrams and trigrams and things like that. There will be other demographic features. So often they come in groups, and you might be able to evaluate the contribution of groups of variables, you know. But it is a problem. And I would say, as I said in the beginning, statistical learning just tries to distinguish itself a little bit from just machine learning in that that is part of the focus, trying to understand the models and, and what goes into them. Yeah. So that's all the time we have. That's all the time we have. Well, thank you again for coming, and, and it's been great to have you here. Yeah. Thank you, Trevor, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.